Shadows, Espionage, Conspiracy, Lies, Perseus. Codename Perseus, the ghost of a Soviet spy who supposedly stole nuclear secrets from the Manhattan Project during the Cold War, right under the nose of the United States government. A man who was so good, to this day, it's hotly debated whether he even existed. The United States government says the so-called spy, Perseus, was simply misdirection by the Soviets, while the Soviets claim he was one of their best spies. And because of him, they obtained classified atomic secrets that turned the tide of the Cold War. Hey everyone, my name is Alan and welcome to Vivid Crackle. I spent over 20 years traveling all over the world and I've seen some pretty weird stuff. I'm fascinated with the mysterious and the unexplained. So if that's something you're interested in, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel and join me on this exploration of the unknown, the mysterious, and the occasional conspiracy. And as we go through this story, if you have any theories about Perseus or another story you'd like me to cover, just let me know in the comments. All right, let's get into it. During World War II in 1943, Colonel Carter Clark began hearing rumors through U.S. intelligence that there might be a peace deal forming between the Soviets and Germany. This would have been a huge, potentially war-changing event if it happened. So he gathered a group of code crackers together and put them to work intercepting and decoding thousands of pages of encoded messages being sent from the Soviets. This was all to find out if the rumors were true. And so, through this, on February 1st, 1943, the Venona Project was born. This was a small, secretive, and classified group whose primary purpose was to decrypt coded messages being sent by the intelligence agencies of the Soviet Union. This group was mostly incredibly smart young women, and from the time of its opening until October 1st, 1980, Project Venona intercepted and decoded 3,000 messages to spies all over the world. And the program was pivotal in countering the efforts of the enemy spies and uprooting others like the Cambridge Five. And their beginnings were no different. After months of failures and attempts to crack the Soviet codes, they finally had a major breakthrough when Genevieve Feinstein, a woman whose dream was to be a math teacher but life had made her a crypto analyst, made the first major breakthrough, and it all came together. They found that the Soviets weren't working on a peace deal at all with the Germans. The messages painted a picture of a massive web of espionage, and spies aimed directly at penetrating all the way to the highest levels of the American government. The Soviets had preemptively begun preparing for the Cold War before it ever even happened. And in fact, this very event was one of the big sparks of the Cold War. Now, we'll come back to Perseus in just a moment. But to give a little more context on the Cold War, when World War II ended and Germany surrendered, there was still the question of what would happen with communism in the world. The Soviets were communists, and while the rest of the world associated communism with Nazi Germany, the Soviets did not see them connected at all, and were determined to continue on in communism for as long as they could. They saw the dominance of the United States and their influence in Europe, now that the war was over, as a threat. And there began growing a animosity toward one another. Plus, the fact that the United States had already used an atomic bomb made the Russians even more nervous, and they were determined to outdo the United States in power and in intelligence. Now, back to 1944. On September 2nd of that year, the Venona Project intercepted and decoded a message from New York to Moscow that contained instructions for Soviet spies based in New York to change their code names. This included the names of several high-profile spies, including Liberal, who was eventually discovered to be Julius Rosenberg, the leader of the Soviet spy ring based in New York, who was eventually arrested along with his wife Ethel, and they became the first United States citizens to be executed for treason during peacetime. But one name stood out. There was a spy whose code name had previously been Fogel that was being changed to Pers, who later became known as Perseus. This is the first mention of the notorious spy, but it wasn't the last. In 1942, 
The Manhattan Project had been developing the world's first hydrogen bomb under Robert Oppenheimer at Los Alamos in New Mexico. And while this was an ultra-secretive project with some of the tightest security possible at the time, the Soviets were also very good at sneaking through that security and getting spies in the most unimaginable places. It was later discovered that there were potentially spies within the Manhattan Project itself, giving the Soviets incredibly important atomic secrets. But only three of these spies were identified. These spies were Klaus Fuchs, codenamed Charles, which you would think a guy being named Klaus during World War II would be enough to make the people around him think twice about bringing him into one of the most secretive projects on the planet. But aside from his name, he had also been a member of the Communist Party. But he claimed those things were in the past, so they brought him into the project because he was an expert and he was incredibly smart. Next, there was Theodore Hall, codenamed Imlad, who also worked on the Manhattan Project and provided the Soviets with detailed descriptions of the bomb itself, plus instructions on how to purify plutonium. And then David Greenglass, codenamed Caliber, who also worked on the Manhattan Project and was a machinist. He provided sketches and other cross-sections of the bomb to the Soviets. Now, those were the three that were caught. The fourth was Perseus. And over the next 50 years, most of the other spies that were based in the United States were identified by Venona, except for Perseus. Now, just to be clear, there were other spies that were never identified. But the fact that Perseus was in the Manhattan Project made him especially mysterious and especially sought after. Perseus, this Soviet spy, he remained a complete mystery and he faded into more of a legend and a myth than anything else. It seemed the mystery of Perseus would fade into history until April 1991, when Russian Colonel Vladimir Chikov wrote two articles in a Russian newspaper called The New Times. In this newspaper, he spoke about an elite Soviet spy named Perseus, who was alive and well, still active, and the American government had no idea who he was. In this article, he gave some details about Perseus's recruitment. He said that Perseus was offered money to spy for the Soviets. He said, oh no, for God's sake, I'm willing to cooperate them for a cause, not for money. I want to dedicate my life to averting the danger of a nuclear holocaust looming over mankind, because I have just realized how real the threat of such a holocaust is. And this prompted me to counter it in the ranks of the Soviet intelligence service. If you think that sounds like the epitome of Soviet propaganda right there, which I certainly do, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people legitimately did help the Soviets for all kinds of reasons that had nothing to do with money. And countless soldiers have given their lives in pretty much every country all over the world for virtually no or very little pay for as long as war has existed. So it isn't much of a stretch to think that this could be a true statement. Over the next few years, several other Soviet spies and sympathizers came out and confirmed the existence of Perseus as a fourth spy in the Manhattan Project. They were booksellers in New York, but were also spying for the Soviets. They were eventually caught and convicted, and in 1995, Morris gave a detailed interview about his life as a KGB spy. This was produced on a program called The Red Files on PBS, and he talked about how they communicated with the KGB largely by sending books they claimed had been sold over to Russia, and with invisible ink that would indicate the line and page where the person receiving the message was to go. And by reading that line on that page, they were supposed to decipher what Lana and Morris needed. Since they were a bookstore, they would have receipts and proof of sale, and so nobody ever questioned them whenever they were sending these books over to the Soviets. I mean, innocent Soviets like to read as well, right? Another way that this couple communicated was with a special radio that they hid in a hole underground underneath their refrigerator. Through the course of this interview, 
Morris tells the story of his wife being recruited for a mission. She was given the task of meeting with a second scientist spy, which up until now, there was only one known spy for the Soviets that was a scientist. She was supposed to meet this contact at the University of New Mexico, and this spy was supposed to give her documents that she then was supposed to turn around and bring back to New York. And again, they only knew about three spies. So a second scientist would mean that there were four spies because there were only three that were known. She took a 36 hour nonstop train ride and arrived at a room that she was told to stay in there in New Mexico. She said that the room was comfortable and most of the people there were railway workers, so she felt really safe and she didn't think that she would arouse any suspicion by being there. She was supposed to meet this person who was described as a young looking man, he looked about 27 years old, and he would be carrying a stack of what appeared to be school books at a specific place on the university campus. The location was chosen because there would be students everywhere carrying big stacks of books, so nobody would think twice about seeing a young man carrying also a stack of books. She went three times to the meeting place and the man never showed up. And she was about to give up and go back home, apparently failing her mission, but she decided to give it one more try. This time, she goes to the university and there appears this man, 27 years old, with a big stack of books, who actually arrives at the meeting place. She thinks he fits the description, so she goes up to him and starts to talk to him, and the man says that she's mistaken. He is not the person that she's supposed to be meeting there. But she's sure that he is, so she starts to try and speak with some code words and let him know that she's also with the Soviets, and eventually he realizes, oh, this is his contact. And so he starts to communicate with her and lets her know that he is in fact the person that she's been looking for. He tells her that he had missed the other meetings because of some kind of miscommunication. Somebody else had made a mistake and it wasn't his fault. He gave her a big stack of journals along with a large envelope and then he turned around and he left. So Lana, she went back to her room, got all of her stuff that she had already left packed there together and she goes straight to the train station and goes right back on that 36 hour bus ride back to New York. She shared that those 36 hours were some of the most stressful moments of her life because she was so nervous about getting caught. Now, she didn't really have any issues. She was stopped twice by two different people, but they were just friendly people trying to make conversation. And she makes it all the way back to New York and turns in these materials, which are major secrets about the atom bomb that's being built. But for her and for Morris, the story sort of ended there. And aside from Morris confirming that all of this happened, Lana herself confirmed through a phone call later on that this happened as well and she confirmed this right before she died, so there was no reason for her to make the story up. Linked to Lana and Morris is Anatoly Yatska. He was the Soviet consul in New York during that whole time, and Anatoly not only confirmed Lana's story, saying that she was essentially his contact and that he was the one who actually recruited her and sent her to New Mexico, but he also said that he had received information directly from Klaus and from Perseus. Then, the NSA itself briefly mentions Perseus on its report on the history of the Venona project. In the section on the Rosenberg slash atomic bomb espionage, it says this. These messages disclose some of the clandestine activities of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Harry Gold, Klaus Fuchs, David and Ruth Greenglass, and others such as the spy known by the cover name Imlad, Theodore Hall, or the important but still unidentified hers. So maybe Perseus isn't the only one we should be looking into. But here we are. And with all of this, it seems like while we don't know who Perseus is, we at least know that he was most likely a real spy who was actively working against the United States. He was incredibly sneaky and managed to get away without ever being caught. At least that's what we thought until 1994. In 1994, the first real cracks of doubt started to form with Pavel Sudoplatov. Pavel was a senior Soviet official who spent 34 years in multiple intelligence branches of the Soviet military. He was the one that provided management for the Soviet espionage efforts all over the world. He wrote a book called Special Tasks, where he gave detailed information about his work in the Soviet government. And in this book, he makes one very bold and possible possibly key statement about Perseus. He said, it should not be excluded. 
Perseus is a creation by Yatskov or his colleagues to cover the real names of the real sources. Which, I will say, just sounds exactly what all code names are supposed to do. They're supposed to cover the names of real identities. But a lot of people took that to understand that Perseus was never a real person. And several others have also concluded that Perseus was either not real or once the Soviets heard that the Americans were looking for someone named Perseus, they decided to take advantage of it and to play the name up in order to make it look like they had some kind of super spy and hopefully to either get more government funding or at least make some money whenever they're able to sell the rights to the story down the line. But once again, even if it's true that the Soviets exaggerated the Perseus story after they found out the Americans were looking for him, it doesn't give any reason for the fact that these original code names did have someone with the code name Fogel and that it was changed to Perse. That is undeniable. And to say that the Soviets planted that name on purpose from the very beginning suggests that the Soviets knew the US had cracked the code and for a totally random reason, slipped in this one single fake name to throw them off, leaving the real code names and real information right there mixed in. If the codes were fake, why would they still give legitimate, real information about their espionage efforts, but then just throw in Perseus to throw a couple people off? It really doesn't add up. There are plenty of people who believe that Perseus was real, and some have even claimed to be able to identify him. In 1999, Jeremy Stone, the president of the Federation of American Scientists, also known as FAS or FAS, wrote a book called Every Man Should Try. And in this book, he says that he read Vladimir Chikov's articles in the New Times, and he said that when he read the statement that Perseus made about being recruited and refusing money and wanting to dedicate his life to averting a nuclear holocaust, something clicked for him. He said, On reading the article, I thought I realized who Perseus was, because of a paragraph that Perseus had uttered 50 years before to his recruiting KGB officer. And despite the fact that this paragraph had been translated into Russian and back into English, and then modified at least slightly, there was a statement and a turn of phrase that seemed to me to identify the speaker like a thumbprint. Any original atomic scientist who would say that he would dedicate his life to averting the danger of a nuclear holocaust would still be among FAS's original members. And if that person were still living, he would be helping us still. Now, in the book, Stone never outright tells who Perseus is. He only gives some details and refers to Perseus as Dr. X. But either Stone didn't do a very good job of keeping Dr. X's identity a secret or purposefully provided just the right details for him to be identified. Because pretty much immediately after the book was released, all fingers pointed to the physicist Philip Morrison. Unfortunately though, Stone accusing Morrison of being Perseus based on a few words he read in an old newspaper article was a pretty flimsy basis for the accusation, and Morrison's response was very solid. The only other evidence Stone had was that he had already confronted Morrison in the past about this, suggesting indirectly that he might be Perseus, and Morrison had supposedly gotten so nervous that his knees were trembling. But Morrison had answers for all of this. Chikov has said that Perseus had fought in the Spanish Civil War, but during the Spanish Civil War, Morrison was studying at Berkeley. Morrison also had polio as a child and had always had to walk with a cane since then, and the damage to his legs made them tremble, which explained why they were trembling when he was being confronted about being Perseus. Stone eventually went on to say, in the light of these facts, which I certainly cannot contradict, I can only accept your denial that you are Perseus, saying that he is not Perseus. There are several other people who have been accused of being Perseus, but there's never been anyone that ticks all those boxes and fits the entire description. The closest person would be Theodore Hall, because he fits the description of Morris Cohen as someone who was young enough to fit in as a student at the university meetup. Perseus was supposedly recruited in New York City and Hall was recruited by the KGB when he was visiting his family who happened to live in New York City. And we also know that Hall was in fact a Soviet spy in the Manhattan Project, and he was caught and convicted. He would be the perfect person, except for the fact that he had already been identified as codename Imlad. So the only way he could be Perseus would be if he had two codenames. What are your theories? Thanks for watching.